Howdy, Beefalo Bart here, and welcome. World War II German heroes. Yes, that's what I want to talk about. Okay, so... Some of you may know that um, while I was in the United States Army, one of my duty stations was in Berlin, Germany. I absolutely loved it. Of course, my, my hobbies included um, chasing Fraulein's, Drinking, mm, chasing for lines and drinking. Yeah, that was pretty much about it. Um, <laughs> back then, you know, if you wanted to um, play video games, there were no computer games, there were no real consoles, there was, you know, there were, but nothing like what we have today. So it just wasn't a normal thing to actually play games. And if you did, you had to go to an arcade. So, quick story. So, um, this is a true story, by the way. Uh, I've told the story once before, and I'm going to tell it again because I'm old and I do that. So, <laughs> uh, was at uh, I believe it was uh, the Kudamek in Berlin, and the very basement area there was a an U-Bahn, a, a, a train station, like a subway train station. The next level up, which was still underground, was um, yeah, the arcade a bar, I think a little restaurant, and maybe one or two other things down there, and then it continued up, it was a department store that was multiple levels going all the way up, there was a theater and all that kind of stuff, but it was down inside the um, the arcade playing, and it was time to take a break from all that, you know, savage video game playing, and walked over to a little bar down there in the basement, and was sitting there having a beer, and trying to enjoy myself, by myself, and I um, kept noticing this older gentleman that was sitting at the, the, the corner, you know, up against the wall, and, you know, the far side of the bar there. And um, he would look at me for a little bit. And if I turned towards him, he'd look away and, you know, look like he was sad and he was starting to cry. And I'm like, what's los, my What's los? You know, what's, what's wrong? You know, what's going on? And, you know, the bartender, he spoke, you know, pretty good English. And um, so I was asking the bartender, like, what's wrong with this guy over here? And he walked over and was talking to him for a minute. And then, you know, he motioned for me to come over. I'm like, okay, whatever. I grabbed my beer and I walked over and I sat down next to the old gentleman. And the three of us started talking. And the older gentleman didn't speak any English. And the bartender was kind of our go-between on the conversation and I was like, well, why are you so upset? Um, and he explained that during World War II, he was a German soldier to Wehrmacht. And um, he saw me and, and thought that I was a, a nice young man. And, you know, of course, he might have been wrong. But uh, but he thought I was a nice young man. And he was a little intoxicated. So, you know, a few Weizenbeers or a few Pilsner down the, the windpipe and... It can affect people in different ways, but he was really sad, and the reason why he was sad is that he thought that perhaps he had been responsible for killing somebody who might have been part of my family, and that, you know, he was ashamed of that, and a lot of German soldiers after World War II were either ashamed of their service, or they just wanted to get it behind them because it was a war they really didn't want to fight, we're talking about the actual German soldiers. We're not talking about the people who were killing the Jews and, you know, the real shitbags. I'm talking about the average German soldier who was out there on the front lines fighting just like any other soldier would. And, you know, he was ashamed of his service. And I'm like, don't be ashamed of what you did. You were a soldier. You were doing what you were ordered to do for what you were told was for the better of your country and I could never hate another soldier for doing his duty you know a soldier is a soldier and as long as you followed what you were told to do and you you did your your duty then you did what was right for what you thought and I explained to him that I, I did not hold any hatred towards him that I could never hate him for doing his duty and that um, if anything that I was proud to, to know that he was a good person and that he cared and you know that kind of stuff and just 
trying to reassure him, and I was was honest about it. And he continued to cry because he was really sad at that point. And you know, we shook hands and you know, even had a, shared a hug. And yeah, it was a really touching moment. So as I keep thinking about it a little bit more and more, I I loved my time in, in Berlin. Beautiful, um, beautiful city. And there was a lot of good people. Of course, there was a lot of shitbags. You know, we had problems with, you know, there were, were pockets of the town that you didn't go to because of the skinhead Nazi wannabes. It still linger till today, not just in Germany, but here in the United States. But uh, there were um, other sections of town you didn't go to because there were, you know, some of the Turkish crowd there were were gang related and they didn't like Americans and there were other pockets that just didn't like Americans and I can understand I don't like most Americans either but <laughs> and I and I are one but yeah um, I always wondered were there any true heroes of of the German soldiers and why do we never hear anything about them what why not it's because they weren't the popular kids. They weren't the the ones that were celebrated. They didn't win the war. How can you have a hero in, in the losing side? Well, there were heroes. There were good people who served in, in the enemy um, side, as we consider them to be the enemy. Um, Germans are our allies now. Um, but there were heroes in Germany, and they deserve respect. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm talking about the German soldier that was on the ground in a tank, in an airplane. Yeah, I mean, we were doing terrible shit to them. They were doing terrible shit to us. So, you know, push all that to the side and just think about the fact that we celebrate our heroes. Why can't they celebrate their heroes? And why can't we acknowledge them? So I just want to look at a couple stories really quickly. Um, the first one I'm going to pull up here, and I know you're tired of looking at my desktop. Um, this kid, and he's a kid. He's a child. He's 18 years old at the time of this. Um, he was, he, he and his platoon were stationed at a, a farm. And I'm not even going to pronounce the name. G-O-I-R-L-E. Jarl or whatever, but um, the Allied forces moved in and were attacking, shooting, and engaging in combat with them. And they were inside this farmhouse. They were going to try to go down to the basement and try to take refuge from all the gunfire and everything else or whatever. And um, Karl Heinz Roche, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, but Karl saw uh, two of the farmer's kids that were in harm's way. And out of instinct, being a good person, he sees these two kids, they're in danger. He got up, ran out, tried to get to them and, and grab them and brought them to safety. He ran outside again um, and as he came back up again, he was hit by a grenade and pretty much just torn to shreds. He got nothing. He got no mention whatsoever. This was a small Dutch town, an occupied Dutch area, and well, they were hated. These were, you know, the enemy that was occupying their territory. I mean, whatever. But he saw two kids that were in danger and he risked his life and gave his life to save those two kids. Um, it was kept under wraps for 60 years because he was just a damn kraut, was the words that were put to it. And that's just sad. I mean, even his parents, and, and this is from the, the article here, even his parents and grandparents did not know how he actually died he, they just knew that he was killed in, in action. Um, so for 60 years, you know, this the story was kept under wraps. Um, but the kids that were actually the two that got saved, they came forward and they said, you know what, 
he deserves some recognition. We wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for him. After he got us out of the way, he ended up getting killed by a grenade. He gave his life to protect these two kids. So, eventually they did um, put up a small monument. Um, I don't think there's any, you know, there was a small monument here that was finally put up with a statue of him holding the two kids. So he did finally get a little recognition, but still, it took 60 years for that to come about. Kind of messed up. Um, this one really isn't so much about a hero in general. This is um, a story of a German soldier and an American soldier. You see there's an M26 and an M4 Sherman and this little black Opel car here. Um, the M26 was engaged in pretty much a street you know, slugfest with a couple German tanks and a German tank just kind of dished around a corner and at this time adrenaline's pushing they're pretty much they're told they need to if they see anything moving put a bullet in it there shouldn't be anybody out there but combatants so if you see something moving and it's not yours um, put holes in it so as soon as this black car comes rushing out and out of instinct and out of orders of what you're supposed to do the um, M26 open fire and riddle the car full of bullet holes well it just happened to be a young lady who was trying to escape this the, the, the combat and as the car came to a stop she collapsed at trying to get out of the car um, the medics were called they came up and these are actual pictures there was actually a video that that was shot by um, um, a correspondent that actually videoed this happening and the pictures here are some of those pictures from that 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 actual combat scene um, you see the medics there trying to render aid um, well, that was the young lady uh, let's see, there were some other pictures here I want to scroll back up to and look at. Um, yeah, that's her. She actually died from her injuries. Um, but this soldier, this guy here, um, he was one of the ones that was responsible for pulling the trigger on, on this car. And, yeah, it, it worried him and it bothered him for years and years and years after the war. And, um, it just it ate at him and it just yeah if if you killed a civilian and you know you saw this young lady that was you know just trying to get out of the way and she ended up getting in the way and getting killed it wore on his soul so bad that he actually went back to the same town in Cologne um, Whereas the he found out the some of the crew from the tank that he was trying to, to kill, and it turns out as well this gentleman here who was still alive, um, the gunner who actually um, also had the same orders. If you see something that's moving and it's not yours, put bullet holes in it. So he snap fired and shot the car as well. So this poor woman driving this little black opal car got shot at the same time by an M26 and by I believe it was a Panther um, both engaged on this poor car and they both shot this woman at the same time basically and not only did this American soldier that was in the, the M26 did it really just eat him alive that it just it gnawed at his soul well, it turns out <laughs> the German soldier who, you know, the gunner that actually pulled the trigger on, on her as well, had the same issues. It plagued him for so many years after the war and that, you know, until he finally found out who she was, her name, and where she was buried, and he would frequently go and visit her gravesite and ask for her forgiveness. So the two of these guys met many many years after the war 
and shook hands, became friends, and recanted the story <laughs> about what happened. And yeah, at least it may not be a, a positive, happy ending to the story because she still died, but it showed the human heart not just on the American side, but the German side, the German soldier and the American soldiers who were both involved in, in killing this poor woman. It aided them so bad that it haunted them till the day that they died, probably. So a little bit different kind of story with a weird twist to it. Um, you can look it up. This was on CNN. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go into this guy next, which just a pure badass, okay? Uh, the article is kind of screwed up. There's no actual pictures of him, I believe, unless that's him right there. Um, during World War II, this gentleman here, um, his name will probably sound familiar to people who are fans of the A-10 Warthog, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Um, uh, World War II German Colonel Hans Rudel. Um, he was issued uh, one of the, the higher versions of the Iron Cross for his actions. Um, he was a Stuka pilot, flew over 2,500 combat missions, and survived the war. <laughs> okay, you think about it, the American soldiers. Our fly boys, they just had to fly 25 combat missions and boom, they're back to stateside. They're done. 25 combat missions and they can go home. Well, this dude here, 2,500, more over 2,500 combat missions and then survived the war. So, pretty badass. Um, his kill record. Now, this is not the lives that he took. This is aircraft and so forth and you think if it was a bomber it might have five six seven eight people crew that might have died from one aircraft kill so we're not talking about the actual people he killed and yes primarily these were americans and british and so forth but you know what he was a soldier he was doing his job and he did it damn well so got no problem with that but in his 2500 plus combat missions he shot down 11 aircraft, over 500 tanks, 170-plus <laughs> artillery targets, 70 landing craft, a Russian battleship, a battle cruiser, a destroyer, and over 1,000 various vehicles. <laughs> That's just badass. This dude, 500, over 500 tanks. That's just badass. Um, and he was never shot down. He was never shot down in over 2,500 combat missions. Um, he was forced to land over a dozen times. But he landed, which means he got up, walked away, got into another airplane, and he's back in combat again. Um, so he was never fully shot down. But the reason why he had to pretty much landed and ditched his aircraft was um, ground fire while strafing and killing over those 500 tanks and, and everything else. So kind of understandable. And shrapnel from tanks that were exploding. <laughs> okay. Um, he exacted billions of dollars and destroyed Russian war materials. <sighs> you know... That's just badass. He was, I mean, for a single pilot to do over a billion dollars in, in, in damages, I mean, over 500 tanks, 170 artillery, 70 landing craft, a battleship, a battle cruiser, a destroyer, and, and over a thousand vehicles. That's a hell of a career. And 11 aircraft. His skill were, did not go unnoticed. His skill, and it says right here, his skill and tactics were so undeniable the U.S. government contracted him as an advisor on the development of the A-10 Thunderbolt II Warthog. 
and he stated the JU87, which is the um, the Stuka, <coughs> with the 37 millimeter cannon <coughs> under the wings, <coughs> excuse me, gave the potential tank killing ability, but at the cost of maneuverability. <coughs> so yeah, he, he was such a badass pilot during for ground attack role primarily that after World War II he was held in such respect that he was contacted later to help develop what I think is our greatest asset the A-10 uh, Warthog I, I don't think really there might be some other th people who might think otherwise but I think the A-10 is probably the best ground attack aircraft in the world for fixed wing yeah, Apache's pretty badass but that's not fixed wing fixed wing wise yeah the A-10 so I just thought I would share that. And he is a true war hero for his accomplishments. He was a soldier. He wasn't one of those shitbags that were killing Jews. This was a true soldier. And he had a hell of an impressive record. Alright, I'm going to finish off with one more story. And we'll finish up on this. General Dietrich von Salken. I know I'm not pronouncing that correctly. All right. He is, as he puts here, literally the archetypal, monocled, partisan Prussian general. I mean, he has a monocle. I mean, he's <laughs> a German general. You know, he in World War Two, in World War One. Excuse me. He was wounded seven times in battle, decorated very highly for valor, and stayed in the German army. Um, yeah, he uh, had a pretty good career in World War I and um, served in, in numerous battles in World War II, being decorated many more times. So he was a, a good general. He's old school general, okay? Um... In February 1945, after 35 years of loyal and distinguished service, he was dismissed by the German military um, for insisting it was pointless to continue the war. He said, oh, well, you know, this, it's pointless to keep fighting the war. We shouldn't should do it. So they're like, you know what? Screw you. Get out of here. You're fired. <laughs> you know? At least he was fired, not shot. A month later, he was reinstated back because um, it was he was too good of a general to do without. Well, after being reinstated, Hitler himself summoned this general to his bunker and gave him his orders. He was to defend Prussia from Russia, you know, defend Germany from Russia. Um, he didn't much care for Hitler to begin with. Not a good thing whenever one of your generals doesn't really care for you. Um, but, yeah, instead of doing the, the Heil Hitler and doing the um, Nazi Party salute, you know, throwing the right arm out, um, instead, he did kind of a half-assed military-style salute instead of the Nazi salute. You know, the regular salute like we're used to with, you know, bringing the hand to the forehead. and He did a military salute instead of the, um, the Nazi throw the arm out Heil Hitler thing. That's kind of a no-no. For over a year at that point, that was mandatory that you did the, the Nazi salute deal. And he's like, whatever, I'm just, I'm a military uh, general. I'm saluting with a military salute. And he did a half-ass salute to begin with. Um, his peers, not just him, you know, I'm talking about Hitler, but his peers, the higher generals, were just kind of giving him that eat, shit, and die look. <laughs> he's like, they're looking like, boy, you're fucking up. <laughs> you you better do right. You're in front of Hitler. And um, after getting his orders, he's going to, you know, don't you know, be in defense of, of against the Russian um, military coming in. He was then told that um, um, you will be reporting to there's some um, other gentleman that was a Nazi party leader not a general but a Nazi party leader that's eh, not going to work I mean this dude's old school uh, military 
he's like, you know, it's like saying, oh, you're going to have to report to the, the, the senator or whatever else. You're reporting to a politician. You're a general. You're a freaking warfighter. Why the hell should you have to report to a, a politician? He's like, you know what? This ain't going to work. <laughs> um, he's still in Hitler's bunker, in, in front of Hitler. And Hitler just wasn't really paying attention anymore. He's like, I, you know, gave you your orders, you know, go do your thing. And he no longer had the attention of Hitler. So he wanted to get Hitler's attention again. So he slams his hand down on the table. Well, that got Hitler's attention for sure. <laughs> I could imagine everybody else in the room butthole just puckered up so freaking tight that you know he had the audacity to slam his fist on the table to get Hitler's attention they kill people for a lot less than that yet um <laughs> so with Hitler's full attention <laughs> he tells Hitler um I have no intentions Herr Hitler of taking orders from a whatever the, the German word is there basically I, I have no intentions Herr Hitler of taking orders from a politician what the immortal hell dude just slams his fist on the ca table and says you know what that ain't work for me chief I ain't doing it <laughs> I'm not reporting to this, this schmuck I could imagine you could hear a pin drop you know, just that that overall tension in the room of wait a minute. First off, you just slammed your your fist on the table to get Hitler's attention, and then you called him Herr Hitler and instead of Mein Führer, you know, which is what you're supposed to call him back then. Herr Hitler, that's like, listen, dude, I ain't playing that shit. <laughs> you know, just total disrespect. He's like, I, I am not. I have no intentions of taking orders from a damn politician. Holy hell. There was silence for a while. And Hitler said quietly, Okay, have command of it yourself. <laughs> and he kind of waved him off. <laughs> Dude had some just world-class nuts. I mean, he doesn't look like he's, you know, I mean, I'm not saying he's, you know, anything bad about his looks or anything. I'm just saying he doesn't look like that thug, you know, you know, stand up and, you know, basically tell Hitler what he's going to do or not going to do. He just doesn't have that, that asshole vibe to him. He's like, you know what, dude, that shit ain't going to work. He doesn't look like a cocky asshole, in other words. So... The reason why I included his story is just because of his frickin' audacity. The king-sized nuts this dude had to just stand right there and slam his fist on Hitler's desk and say, I have no intentions, Herr Hitler, of reporting to that politician. Holy shit. <laughs> so, that's why I included his story. Um, yeah, <laughs> that was just craziness. If you do some Google searching, you'll find a lot more stories about actual war heroes um, from Germany. German soldiers who were just the regular soldier who committed acts of bravery to save their fallen comrades or to save a civilian or to do something that a hero would do and we never hear anything about him and this kind of comes about because of you know the whole game development ideas and so forth and we always see these video games and movies that portray the Germans as the the twisted enemy dark overlords that you know we must kill all of them oh you're German we must kill you and you know that just it's crap um, we always see the German soldiers as the bad guy. We always see the German, you know, in video games as the enemy. Um, some games allow you to play as a German soldier, but do they actually give you the true experience of being a soldier and and knowing the hardships that these the normal German soldiers went through? 
not every German soldier was a Nazi and, and was murdering Jews. So, I think that we need to see more movies, TV shows, or video games that are based on what it was like for the German soldier during World War II. We've had a couple of games that give us a taste of what it's like to be a Russian soldier during World War II. There's a couple of good games that, that show that. Um, countless video games and movies and TV shows that show what it was like for American soldiers. Well, what about the Japanese? Japanese soldiers, um, yeah, they were the enemy, and they, they invaded China, and they did these atrocities, and the things that they did to those poor Chinese people were not far off from in, from what the uh, Germans were doing to the Jews. So, yeah, they, they weren't, you know, perfect little angels, you know, they were our enemy as well, but look at some of what they went through. How they were Japanese soldiers. There was one that was still in the Philippines that refused to acknowledge and, and knew that the war had ended and was still defending his post till 1974. For like 30 years after the damn war ended and he's still holding his post and refused to surrender. And it actually took someone going there from the Japanese military to dismiss him. <laughs> to say, dude, the war's been over for 30 damn years. It's time for your ass to get home. So they paid him his back pay of like $300 and a little little stipend. Like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, a little shit retirement to go along with it. $300 back pay for 30 years? Not too good. Um, think about the loyalty that the Japanese soldiers had to their cause. I'm not saying it was right or wrong, I'm just saying think of the loyalty that they had. Kamikazes. Could you imagine walking onto an Air Force base saying, hey, um, I'm going to need some pilots to, um, to load up your F-15, F-18, F-22, A-10 Warthog, whatever. I, I'm going to need you to load your aircraft with lots of bombs, but we're going to rig them to blow up on impact, and we're going to need you to sit on this um, artillery shell, and you know, we're, we're going, to, going to need you to go ahead and take your airplane and just fly it directly into this ship, or fly your plane directly into this um, ammo dump, or whatever. You're going to fly your plane, you're going to stay in the plane. You're going to die in the airplane. You're going to kill yourself while you're guiding your airplane into destroying this target. Think how well that shit's going to go over. Damn brig would fill up awful damn fast, or a lot of people will be getting shot, good or bad. Convince somebody today to sacrifice their life in that manner. Okay, yes, you join the military, you go into combat doesn't matter what country you're fighting for um, and just to say okay you're going to kamikaze attack that shit wouldn't play nobody I don't think anybody today would have the fortitude to be able to do that do I think it's right hell no but um, these people would volunteer I will do this for my emperor my, my country I, I will be was it the Wings of Destiny? Um, the Kamikazes had a... It was a religious duty to their emperor, their country, what have you. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be disrespectful on that, but they volunteered to sacrifice their lives willingly for the good of their country. Not just going into combat and getting killed while in combat. No, they volunteered to commit suicide to try to blow up a ship or something of that nature. Gotta have some respect for someone that has that much belief and that much internal fortitude. And yeah, you. you a kamikaze. Well, that's a cowardly thing. They just pilot the airplane right in. Would you do it? I'm not gonna. Tell me who out there would actually do that. So, 
I have respect for them. A lot of respect. I have respect for soldiers. I don't give a damn if you're in the German army during World War II, Russian army, Japanese army, navy, air force, marines, whatever. I'm talking about military wise. Um, you know, think about the Russian soldiers during World War II. They were being forced into an attack that they knew that they couldn't win, but if they tried to retreat, their own officers would shoot them as they were trying to fall back. There's a difference between being a coward and running from combat and knowing, hey, this is kind of a pointless approach. We need to try something else. This shit ain't working, Chief. We need to do something else. Well, they would just kill them and just send more troops in. Think of the stupidity of D-Day or beach invasions in general. Okay, they have 5,000 troops that are heavily dug in with artillery and heavy machine gun emplacements. So if they've got 1,000, let's send in 50,000. They can shoot all our guys up, whatever. They just We just keep... We send enough people in... We send enough troops in, then we're just going to overwhelm them. They, they can't kill all of those troops. If we send all these troops in, there, they can't kill all of them. So some of them are going to make it through. What kind of bullshit is that? When you've already got paratroopers going in behind the lines to neutralize supply lines, artillery pieces, things of that nature, why would you send all these kids onto that beach in front of all those machine guns and all those artillery pieces and so forth. I don't give a shit that you just dumped it, an assload of ordnance from those ships. Destroyers to battleships pounding the, the emplacements and so forth. Pointlessly wasting ordnance on shit they couldn't penetrate. You know, the, the bunkers on that, on the, those walls, you know, the, that wall along the beach. They weren't penetrating that shit, even battleships bombs weren't doing anything to it. It was pointless. We sent thousands of kids to their death. 18, 19 year old boys were sent to their death. Yes, they're men because they were serving their country. I understand that, but they were sent to their death because if we send enough numbers, then surely uh, something is going to get through. Iwo Jima. How much ordnance do they drop on that friggin' island? How many bombs do they drop? How much ordnance from ships were, were launched into it? And Japanese soldiers, they just dip back in their caves and <laughs> whatever. When they run out of bombs and shells, we'll just roll our guns back up again and roll our machine guns back up again and start kicking some more ass. <laughs> Kinda gotta respect them for that. Until we went in there with flamethrowers and melted them. Well, that was good, right? So yeah, don't hate a soldier for doing his duty, no matter what country they're from. And you know, and I, I'm saying this from World War One, World War Two, Korean War, Vietnam War, um, whatever. A soldier is a soldier. If they're doing their duty, don't hate them. If it's your job to kill them, kill them. Do your duty. If your duty is to kill the enemy soldier, kill the enemy soldier. You don't have to hate him to kill him. <laughs> I know it sounds stupid, but yeah. Do some homework. Do some research. Look it up. And if you, by some small chance, there's not a whole lot of World War II veterans left, but if you come across a German soldier that was part of the Wehrmacht, I'm not talking about you know, the, the murderers that kill the Jews and that kind of stuff. I'm talking about an actual German soldier. If you're lucky enough to meet one, then thank him for his service. And that thank you for your service stuff, um, yeah, thank a soldier for his service, okay, that's fine. But don't forget to thank a police officer for his service or her service. Those EMTs and paramedics, firefighters, thank them for their service. That girl working at the, the grocery store that's working checkout, thank her for her service. The person at the drive-thru at, you know, 
the local Chuck and Puke restaurant. Thank them for their service. But they're just slinging fast food. Do you do it? Do you want to do it? Do you want to work at drive through at Burger King? I damn sure don't. Do you? Somebody's got to. Thank them for being the ones that do, that's doing it. If you're not trying to make somebody smile every day, you're doing it wrong. All right, guys and gals. Love almost all of you. And not just when it's cold. All right, we shall see you later. And have